Before I started tonight, I just had a really important message for you guys. I just wanted to tell you how to do it. Gremlin, you get out of that. You get out of it right now. No, don't you. This is Zach Galligan, Billy from Gremlins 1 and 2, and you are listening to the 80s Slasher Librarian. Gremlins, the novelization by George Guype. Chapter 17. Collapsing on a gentle slope 50 yards from the YMCA building, Billy found himself a spectator of a grim show that was largely his creation. At first, there was little to watch or hear but a greenish glow emanating from the swimming pool area and a faraway giggling chorus. Then there was movement inside the building and a marked increase in the chorus's volume. Soon, Billy could see one form and then dozens moving past the windows each a fully grown gremlin. Oh no, when they multiply as gremlins, they don't lose a beat, do they? Gizmo blinked back a tear. He could have told them of the dangers, and all this could have been avoided if he had been able to communicate better, if these humans had taken his advice. If, if, if. Now there were no more ifs. To Billy's way of thinking, his last hope was now gone. As he and Gizmo scrambled up the slope only minutes before, he had entertained the notion of calling the fire department so that they could set fire to the pods while they were waiting to hatch. But there were no pods, no intermediate stage even momentarily vulnerable to destruction or movement to a place where they could do less harm. Billy sighed. What can we do now, Giz? He asked wearily. Just give up, go home, and wait? There's nothing else we can do, is there? That was the sensible course of action, but he knew he couldn't surrender now. Having helped unleash these devilish creatures on Kingston Falls, and perhaps the world, he owed it to himself and everyone else to do everything possible to rectify his mistake. That was the major, most moral consideration. He also knew that merely sitting still would drive him crazy. I guess, he said slowly, this means we'll have to go to the police. He did not relish explaining what had happened to Sheriff Riley and Deputy Brent, who were as hard-headed a pair as were ever born. Even describing a normal problem to them was often difficult. So hung up were they on the idea that everyone else in the human race was devious, dumb, or both. Added to this was the perfectly reasonable resistance anyone would have to a story dealing with gremlins or other alien creatures. A dedicated movie buff, Billy already had visions of the scenario that would be acted out at the police station. As in so many movies, he would explain what had happened, the police would be skeptical to say the least, then to convince them of his story's validity, he would suggest they go to the high school in order to see both Roy Hansen's body and the remains of a dead gremlin. After much prodding, they would accompany him there and of course both bodies would be missing. Either that, or the gremlins would be gone, and the police would have no choice but to arrest Billy on suspicion of murder. Faced with explaining his story to these men, Billy hesitated, but not long, for the inside of the YMCA was obviously swarming with bodies. Passing by the windows, they made the building look like a dimly lit concert hall or theater, 
a minute after the night's entertainment had ended. Let's go, Giz, Billy said finally. I guess if we're going to stop those guys from taking over the whole town, we'd better tell the cops. A quarter hour later at the tiny Kingston Falls Police Department station, Billy told his story as simply and unemotionally as possible, avoiding as best he could the hysterical sounding descriptions used by movie characters. The reaction of the police was somewhat different than in films or TV, although Sheriff Riley and Deputy Brent did wear the typical, must humor him and maybe he'll go quietly attitude of law enforcement officers in similar situations. Seated at their wooden desk, drinking eggnog from styrofoam cups, they were perhaps more informed and a bit friendlier than one might expect, especially at the outset. When it became obvious that Billy was serious, they allowed him to proceed well into his narrative before interrupting. Gremlins, Riley said at that point. Like little monsters, you say? Right. Green, of course, the sheriff continued, casting an almost imperceptible wink at Brent. Little monsters are always green, you know. Yes, they're green, Billy admitted, wishing they had been some other color. With sharp, pointy fangs and long claws. Yes, sir. Thousands of them, huh? I didn't count, Billy replied. I couldn't. It looked like a couple hundred anyway. Well, a couple hundred little green monsters with fangs and claws is enough, if you ask me. Deputy Brent smiled. Now, where did these uh, gremlins come from? My father, he gave me one as an early Christmas present a few days ago. A present, Riley grunted. Your father usually give you vicious monsters for presents? No, no, Billy replied, a bit more nervous now. You see, they aren't vicious at first. Course not, Brent nodded, his condescension now becoming quite evident. Matter of fact, they aren't even gremlins when they start out, Billy continued. Could you dim the lights in here? Why, they hurt your eyes? No, sir, I've got a mogwai. That's what the gremlin comes from, in this knapsack. But bright light can hurt him, maybe kill him. Brent shot Sheriff Riley a this-is-going-to-be-good look and stifled a yawn, hoping that a look at Gizmo would convince them that they indeed had alien creatures on their hands. Billy waited, trying not to appear manic. After a moment, Brent took a couple of steps toward the wall switch and killed the overhead lights. Billy opened the knapsack, pulled out Gizmo. The two policemen studied him carefully, but with a lack of the affection and delight expressed by other people. This is what a mogwai looks like before he becomes a gremlin, Billy explained. Yeah, Brent nodded. I've seen those before. They come from some South Pacific island. Think they're called a, a weepy or keeply or something. No, sir, Billy corrected. This is not an ordinary animal that lives on Earth. Brent shook his head. Maybe that's what the guy in the pet store told you, Pop, but I seen him on television. One of these wildlife shows. Knowing it was futile to argue with Brent, Billy swallowed his protest. So, uh, this becomes a gremlin, huh? The deputy said. Yes, sir. He can, but he doesn't have to. Knowing he was beginning to sound a bit like the typically incoherent, frustrated, and generally discredited movie character, Billy plunged on anyway. You see, they become gremlins if they eat after midnight. Deputy Brent's cheeks exploded outward as he choked on a slug of his drink. Twin trickles of saffron liquid started to dribble from either end of his mouth. Wiping his lips on his coat sleeve, he turned away, coughing. Eat after midnight, Sheriff Riley murmured, taking up the line of questioning where Brent had left off before becoming convulsed. I don't get it. Maybe he means sundown on Fridays, Brent interrupted, still gagging slightly. <laughs> Jewish gremlins! Let's be serious, Riley said. I'd really like to get to the bottom of this. Now, he turns into a gremlin if he eats after midnight. Midnight in what time zone? You mean I can take this little critter to the state line where the time zones change, and if he eats on one side of the line, it's okay? But if he eats on the other side, he turns into a monster? I, I guess so, Billy stammered. I've never thought of it that way. Oh, and, and is, it the, is it the act of his mouth chewing the food or the stomach digesting it? 
Brent added quickly, having gotten his esophageal problem settled. You know, that food lays around in your stomach a while. Dismissing him with a wave of his hand, Riley asked, How much food? One mouthful after midnight? Is that enough to make him crazy? I guess. Wait, suppose, suppose he eats at 10 o'clock and gets something stuck between his teeth. Something that comes loose after midnight, Brent interjected. Does that count as food after midnight if he swallows it? Is water food? Riley added. Nah, Brent replied. Water's got no calories. If he eats something with calories, that's what does it. How about diet drinks? Riley asked deadpan. They got only a couple of calories. That's all you need, Brent replied. One calorie and it's food. My wife told me about some foods that have minus calories, Riley said. Like your body uses more energy chewing them up than you get from the food. Things like celery and lettuce and raw carrots. Realizing he was getting nowhere fast, Billy took a step toward the door. Sheriff Riley held up his hand. Wait a minute, he said. Where are you going? I'm leaving, I guess, Billy said. I know it sounds crazy, but I didn't make up the rules. We're just trying to find out what's going on, Riley replied evenly, his face betraying very little overt sarcasm. Like, suppose you dropped dead or left that little critter here. If you said he'd grow into a hundred gremlins if we fed him after midnight, I'd like to know more. Like, if it's not okay after midnight, when does okay begin? Six o'clock? Sun up? Another thing, Brent added, not waiting for Billy to reply. How's he do this, uh, multiplication act? Does he need a female or what? Billy sighed, did not answer. He had decided not to tell these men any more about Gizmo nor would he tell them about the incident at the high school. Let them think he was a lunatic if that was their pleasure. At least they couldn't lock him up for that. Listen, I'm sorry I bothered you, Billy said. I guess I just didn't tell my story right, so I don't blame you if you think I'm crazy. I just dropped in to tell you that you may be getting some reports tonight about vandalism or people being attacked or frightened by little green monsters. Maybe you'll believe those people aren't crazy because of me. At least I hope so. And if nothing happens, that's all right, too. Closing the knapsack, cover on Gizmo, he started for the door. As he closed it behind him and walked into the dark, cold night, he heard the two policemen's voices break first into a smothered chuckle and then uproarious laughter. Well, Giz, Billy asked sardonically, how'd I do? <laughs> The series of bizarre and tragic events that convulsed Kingston Falls began a few minutes later. The first episode, a seemingly isolated mishap, was reported by WKF Radio newsman Harmon Ellis at 7.57 p.m. as a local item to fill out the second hour of his evening talk show. Little did he realize at the time that it was but the tip of a catastrophic iceberg that would keep him and his listeners in a frenzy for the rest of the night. I have here a warning for motorists in the Kingston Falls area. All four traffic signals at the intersection of Randolph Road and Route 46 have become jammed with green showing in both directions. Two cars and a tractor trailer collided there about a half hour ago. All three drivers assuming they had a clear road ahead. Both cars were heavily damaged, but no one was seriously injured. Motorists are advised to avoid this intersection, Randolph Road at Route 46 until maintenance crews can repair the sticking signals. Stay tuned to this station and we'll let you know when traffic is moving smoothly again. Remembering that his VW was parked just a couple of blocks from the police station, Billy decided to see if he had gotten a ticket or the car had been towed away during the three hours since he had been forced to abandon it. I won't be surprised, he muttered to Gizmo. No matter what's happened, it won't shock me. The way the days turned out... Turning the corner, he received the ultimate shock under the circumstances. Not only was the car where he had left it, there was no ticket on the windshield. And when he got in and turned the ignition key, the motor started with the gentlest, most obliging purr within his memory. It's a trick, he murmured. It must be. 
Making a U-turn, he was soon back on Main Street and heading home, but he had no idea what he should do next or whom to contact. All he could do was hope the gremlins somehow got sidetracked before they could do too much damage. Back again with another announcement. Actually, three announcements. That sort of makes me think Kingston Falls is being used as a testing area for pranksters. We now have a traffic signal that is showing red in all four directions and traffic is backed up for half a mile there. It's a mountain road and rolling vista highway. Police are on the way to direct traffic there, so if you're listening to this in a car on one of those thoroughfares, sit back, calm yourself down, and hang on. Just be thankful you're not on Delta Drive near Kermadi Street, which is where pedestrians and motorists alike were attacked by about 50 runaway tires. Somehow they'd gotten loose from a nearby tire warehouse outlet store and started rolling down Kermadi in one mass. Several cars were dented and one woman suffered abrasions when she jumped out of the way of one tire into a utility pole. That's not all. It's been reported tonight by a non-drinking source that customers entering the Governor's Mall shopping plaza were struck by a rain of brooms from the roof of that facility. No less than three dozen at a clip. Security guards at the mall were unable to apprehend the throwers. Anyways, think we're on a gremlin hit list? Probably not. It's more than likely just some last bits of craziness before Christmas. Stay tuned and we'll keep you posted. At the corner near his church, Billy suddenly hit the brakes, sliding sideways and nearly into a snowdrift before coming to a halt. Slamming the car into reverse, he backed up a hundred feet so as to be near the familiar figure coming out of the church's side entrance. Father Bartlett! Billy called out through the partially rolled down window. The hunched figure passed, edged its way across the icy sidewalk toward the car. It's me, Billy Peltzer. Merry Christmas, Billy! Father, please go back to the church, Billy warned. It's not safe out here. The elderly man smiled. I'm just mailing off a last-minute Christmas card, Billy, he said, pulling it from his pocket. Then almost to himself, he added, I sure didn't think they would send me one. Can it wait, Father? I suppose it can, but it's only a block. What seems to be the problem? You think I'll slip on the ice? No, Father, it's a lot worse than that. Will you take my word that it's not safe out here? Mail your letter and come right back. Why, I certainly will. And Merry Christmas to you. Thank you, Father. Same to you. Billy put the car in gear and puttered off. Father Bartlett watched him go, shrugged, and continued his trip to the corner mailbox. As he walked, his eyes darted from side to side and even back over his shoulder once or twice. But no one seemed to be lurking in the shadows or following him. From his work with various youth groups, Father Bartlett knew that young people of today were a lot more serious and susceptible to anxiety problems than their parents or grandparents. It was the world we lived in, and one could hardly blame Billy Peltzer for having a sudden attack of nervousness, even during the holiday season. Arriving at the mailbox, Bartlett pulled down the door and dropped the letter inside. A second later, the card flew back at the Irish father, striking the front of his coat and falling to the snow. Blinking, Father Bartlett reached down and grabbed the letter. Slowly, he opened the mailbox door, peered into the blackness, shrugged, and redeposited the envelope. Again, it flew back. Guess this must be a joke of some kind, he murmured, forcing a good-natured tone to his voice just in case he was being taped. Retrieving the card, he stood silently, surveying the scene about him with nervous eyes. He had seen shows on television, of course, in which the average person was the butt of a joke played by hidden cameramen. But surely, in this poor light, on the other hand, modern technology could accomplish just about anything. He decided to have one more try. Even if he was being taped, he reasoned, he hadn't embarrassed himself. As a matter of fact, his attitude had been quite good, a mixture of genial surprise and amusement. Parishioners seeing such a tape could accuse him of being neither a bad sport nor a dullard. Just in case this was a hidden camera prank, and he certainly couldn't lose anything by assuming it was, he decided to add a cute touch of his own. Pulling down the door once more, he moved his face close to the opening and said in a slightly louder voice, One more try and that's it! Then I'm taking my business to another mailbox? The words were no sooner out of his mouth than he felt his hand gripped by a cold object. 
As he started to pull away, another claw or hand slipped around his neck and started to pull his head into the mailbox. This has gone far enough, he shouted, managing a laugh that was more hysterical than hearty. Now, having lost his hat, his bare head was being forced painfully against the icy cold rim of the mailbox. Twisting and turning, the normally implacable Father Bartlett began to scream for help. What we're going to do now, considering all these reports, is dispense with our regular format and open our telephone line so you can call in and discuss this phenomenon with me between announcements. Now, we don't want to spread panic, but we would be remiss if we didn't report what's going on and warn all of our listeners to stay inside if possible. Get that last-minute Christmas shopping done after the holidays. Your loved ones will understand. Anyway, we've had numerous calls from people who have seen very small animals or humans darting in and out of the shadows. These beings are approximately the size of three-year-olds, but they handle themselves like Olympic athletes. Frankly, we don't know what they are, and the problem is made worse by all these people or things wearing costumes. About 8.15, these things were seen in the vicinity of the Governor's Mall shopping plaza, about the time shoppers began getting caught in the sliding glass doors. According to nine people who received minor cuts and bruises, the doors seemed to open invitingly early for patrons and then snap shut with terrifying speed. Maintenance crews at the mall say the problem is under control now, although most customers are using non-automatic doors. In another section of Kingston Falls, an incident occurred that may or may not be related. Patrons at Simone's, a first-class French restaurant on Winslow Pike, reported that a food fight started there about 8.30. According to one source, portions of food flew from one table to another, although no one saw who threw the food. Several waiters carrying heavy trays were apparently tripped and the tablecloths whisked from beneath the eyes of diners, carrying bowls and dishes into the aisles. Eventually, the scene became so chaotic, a riot with French food broke out. One woman is being treated for French sauce inhalation. You had to go making fun of the kid, didn't you? Sheriff Riley muttered as he and Deputy Brent raced once again for their cruiser. The past hour, after what had started out as a slow night, had been frenetic and inexplicable. Me, Brent replied defensively. You were the one who started it. Anyway, I, I still don't think it's those little green monsters. I think it's kids gone crazy because they got nothing to do. And that radio station that keeps sending out reports every ten minutes ain't helping. Crazy people hear stuff like that, and they start thinking of things they can do to top it. All right, never mind, Riley shrugged. Where are Dudley and Warren? At Governor's Mall? Okay, you and me got a choice. The troubles at the TV station or the people being attacked by Christmas trees, which do you want? Brent shrugged. I'd just as soon leave the media alone, let them solve their own problems... Probably a normal uh, screw-up anyway. Then we'll do the trees. Swinging left on Washington Avenue, Sheriff Riley headed the cruiser back toward the center of town. The streets were fairly deserted, considering it was so close to Christmas, giving Kingston Falls a ghost town atmosphere, but at least that made it easier to get from place to place. Moving rapidly to the end of the block, he turned again at Waterton, the cruiser's wheels spinning slightly as he... What?! was all Riley was able to say before the police cruiser hit the first of a solid wall of upright objects. After grinding and bumping to a halt, the bottom of the car sounding like the hull of a ship struck by a torpedo, the two policemen hopped from the cruiser and surveyed the damage in the glare of the headlights. Now who did this? Brent muttered. Ahead of them, extending for the entire block, were nothing but cinder blocks placed upright on their ends like tiny grave markers. Their square forms lined up one by one as far as the eye could see. Just in from the Kingston Falls Police Department, motorists are advised to avoid using Waterton Avenue between Washington and Adams. Police say that unknown persons have blockaded the street with concrete cinder blocks apparently taken from Williamson's building supply yard nearby. Another bizarre development occurred just a block away from St. Francis of Assisi Church, where Father Edmund Bartlett was mailing a letter. While doing so, he was pulled into the mailbox past his shoulders by a pair of unseen hands or claws, suffering cuts and bruises in the process. 
Meanwhile, a neighbor who spotted Father Bartlett trapped in the mailbox called for help, and he was pulled out. When the helpers got a look inside the box, however, they fled. Unfortunately, that's not the last item in this latest list of unusual events taking place this evening. A basketball game between the Tigers and Wells of the Presbyterian Intermediate League had to be canceled this evening when it was discovered that all of the basketballs had been filled with peanut butter. The contest has been rescheduled for January 8th. Yes? Yes? Okay. Finally, for the moment, we have received word from Channel 10 to the effect that the trouble is not in your set. The station's interference has been caused by unknown problems with the equipment. Did I say gremlins earlier? It certainly looks that way. Stay tuned. Man on the radio said it was gremlins, Murray, Mrs. Futterman said, coming back into the living room with a cup of coffee for her husband. Maybe he said it as a joke. Futterman growled, resisting the temptation to kick his television set. They always say it as a joke, but nobody believes it. When fiddling with the dials, some more failed to improve his fuzzy TV picture. He leaned back wearily. Not again. He muttered. Just when Perry Como was coming on. Him singing Ave Maria again? Mrs. Futterman asked and then continued. I think you'd be sick of that by now. They play it every Christmas. That's part of Christmas. What did the radio say about the television? Gremlins, Mrs. Futterman repeated. Nobody knows. They probably got a bunch of foreign components, if you ask me. Futterman growled. Same with this darn Sony. I knew we should have got a zenith. Flipping the dial, he encountered terrible grainy interference on every channel. His cheeks getting redder with every turn, Slamming his fist against the side of the set, he beamed with delight momentarily as several stations returned in beautiful color, and then banged it again as the cross hatching reappeared. That's not just the one channel. He snarled. It's either the set or the antenna. Well, let's not worry about it now, Mrs. Futterman said with a soft smile. Of course I'll worry about it now. He shot back. My favorite Christmas shows are on. Why should I sit here? and look at snow inside and snow outside. Suddenly, he was on his feet and striding toward the hall closet. His wife merely watched as he started bundling himself up, knowing it was futile to argue against it. Where are you going? She finally asked meekly. I'm gonna check the antenna. He said. Maybe it blew over. Pulling a woolen hat over his head, he went outside to the end of his walkway and looked back toward the roof. The antenna was still intact, but Mr. Futterman hardly noticed. What he noticed much more was that it was surrounded by a trio of small, long-armed figures that brought back a rush of memories from World War II. For a long moment, he simply stood, slack-jawed, staring at the three playing with his antenna. Then, remembering the rifle he kept loaded in a locked closet downstairs, he walked back toward the house, his eyes never leaving the roof until he reached the front porch. Another warning for motorists in the Kingston Falls area. We have reports that a series of detour signs have been placed on the downtown bypass road in such a way that drivers have been circling the reservoir for several hours. Some drivers, in their frustration at not being able to find their way out of this cul-de-sac, have stopped their cars and created huge bottlenecks, not to mention several collisions. All we can tell you about that situation is that several local garages have volunteered to send trucks to lead motorists out of the area. These trucks will have large yellow signs identifying them. Shoppers are advised not to use King Bank's automatic teller at all three locations and West Kelvin's Bank fast cash machines. These are issuing shredded bills and returning ID cards bent in half. Officials of both banks have issued statements saying this is not the work of the so-called gremlins, but as part of normal problems both banks have been experiencing. It took a while for Sheriff Riley and Deputy Brent to calm down the trio of women who had been attacked by the vending machines at the Green Bend Rest Area. 
Having survived what was apparently a very harrowing situation, all three wanted to talk about it. We were standing behind the two rows of machines, the tall woman with bluish hair began. Alice was trying to decide whether or not to get some cheese crackers, when all of a sudden, the soda cans just started coming straight out, not dropping down, mind you, like when you put money in for them, but they were hurled out. One hit me right there, on my dad's shoulder, and another got Maud on the chin. She's still woozy. Brent nodded and made a note on his pad. Not because he needed or wanted it, but because he knew they expected it. Look at this, the one called Alice said, displaying a mean-looking cut at the base of her nose. You wouldn't think this could come from a pack of chewing gum, would you? No, ma'am, Sheriff Riley replied. They just was whizzing out of there, the third woman sighed. I thought it was the end of the world. You know, we're not very agile, the second one said. When they started shooting that stuff at us, we just couldn't get out of the way. The two officers nodded, made a few sympathetic remarks, and returned to their cruiser. As they drove back to Kingston Falls, Sheriff Riley finally stopped muttering to himself long enough to say, Well, I guess we better talk more with the kid. The kid? Yeah, the one with the funny little animal that turns into gremlins if you feed it after midnight. You got his name, don't you? I thought he gave it to you, Sheriff. You had... The complaint sheet, and I saw you write something down after he came in. Oh, that was just a note to remind myself to call home. Great. I think I know who he is, though. He works in the bank. We can find out. All right. I think maybe we better find out what he knows before we do anything else. Lines are still open. That's 922-7400. And be prepared to hang on a while because our switchboard very appropriate for this time of year, is lit up like a Christmas tree. Okay, here's our next caller. Go ahead, sir. You're on the air. Uh, uh yes, uh, my name's Willie Smith, and, uh, I've just come from a Howard Johnson's restaurant that, uh, spit this terrible stuff in my face. The restaurant spit at you. No, no, one of them machines in the men's room that you, uh, used to dry your hands and face, the uh, hot air machines. Yes, go on. Well, well, I turned it on to do my face, and suddenly I was covered with this awful smelling orange stuff, a liquid. Are you at liberty to say what it was? Uh, I don't know. It smelled like it came out of the toilet, except it was older, like with mold, and, well, maybe that's a bit too graphic. Where was the restaurant, sir? Commerce in Lawndale, you know, you know what I think? I think this is part of God's plan. Now it says in the New Testament that The look on her husband's face told Mrs. Futterman that he was about to embark on a holy crusade. Although a generally volatile man, he never got that steely-eyed, twitching, nerve-in-the-cheek expression except when somewhat crazed. She had seen it when someone stole the radio from his car and another time when his favorite football team lost the divisional championship on a bad call by the officials. When he emerged from the basement with his rifle, she knew she had read him correctly. Murray, she said, taking his arm. What is it? Gremlins. He replied. On the roof. What kind of gremlins? No time to explain now. You just stay inside. But if you go out in the street and fire off that rifle, you'll be reported for sure, she protested. Let go of my arm, Jesse, he ordered. She did so, and he continued on his heavy-footed mission. Outside, he was halfway to the street and had the first gremlin in his sights when he realized that Jesse was right. Firing off a rifle from his front lawn was pretty foolhardy, especially when there was a window in the back of the garage which would provide an even better vantage point. Moving quietly into the garage, he groped his way past the snowplow, which took up all but six inches on either side, and pushed the window open. He smiled, for the view of his rooftop was perfect, and from here, the sound of his rifle would be partially muffled. Lining up one of the gremlins, he squeezed off his first shot. The little green demon proved it was neither imaginary nor immortal by falling in a heap and sliding off the roof. Futterman laughed out loud. It felt good to fire the rifle again, 
to be locked in combat with the enemy. A low chattering sound interrupted his excitement and train of thought. Where was it coming from? The rooftop? Somewhere nearby? There was no time to think about it. If the two other troublemakers near his antenna were to be dealt with, he threw the rifle to his shoulder and fired again. Another gremlin dropped. In his excitement and eagerness to bag his third enemy soldier, Futterman hardly heard the snowplow's engine roar to life. The third gremlin started to slide off the roof. Oh no you don't! Futterman yelled, moving the rifle to follow him. In a split second, he had the little target in his sights. Now the snowplow seemed almost to lean forward, its wheels ready to burst from their position, like sprinters from starting blocks. The engine roar became deafening as... Hot dog! Futterman cried out. I got you, you little son of a... He never completed the phrase. With the mammoth lurch forward, the snowplow tore through the back wall of the garage, taking Futterman with it in a shower of timber and bricks. Now all of you are interested in what the weather's going to be for the next few days, but you won't be able to find out by calling for the weather. No one's sure why, but calls to the telephone company's weather number are going directly to Carl's Sub Shop on West Monticello Drive. But you can't get the weather by dialing Carl's Sub Shop because calls for Carl are somehow going directly to the Gambler's Anonymous hotline. A few minutes ago, an official with the phone company informed us that the Kingston Falls relay station was broken into earlier this evening, and that everything is in a state of chaos. So stay off the phone unless it's an absolute emergency. Meanwhile, three more cases of people being trapped in payphone booths turned up in... Well, what do you think, Kate? Dory smiled, leaning forward onto the bar. Think it's gremlins? Commies? The end of the world? Or just ordinary screw-ups? The pub was nearly deserted, thanks largely to the rash of strange and frightening incidents taking place in and around Kingston Falls. At first, the early evening customers tended to regard the bizarre events with satirical amusement. But when reports were heard of electrical malfunctions causing fires a man being electrocuted by his Christmas tree, and other life-threatening situations, even the most hardened scoffer began to think about protecting his loved ones. An even greater exodus from Dory's pub followed reports that in another bar across town, lye, ammonia, aquaregia, and other deadly chemicals had turned up in cocktails. The results was an evening so slow that Dory was seriously considering closing the bar and going home before midnight. It's probably gremlins, Kate replied. That's really what you think? Dory asked, wide-eyed. He had always regarded Kate as a particularly down-to-earth person, incapable of believing in Santa Claus, evil spirits, or other supernatural beings. That's what the guy on the radio thinks it is, she said simply. Dory wondered exactly what had won her over. True, the radio had described incidents involving apparently driverless cars, and more than a few callers had mentioned seeing the little green monsters in the Kingston Falls area. But wasn't it possible that mass hysteria fed by the constant radio reports was taking over? Didn't anyone remember Orson Welles' famous War of the Worlds episode before World War II? Dory didn't actually remember it himself, not having been born yet, but he had read about the panic that had gripped the nation then. Now, hearing Kate's profession of belief in gremlins, he better understood America's abject fear of 1938. If a reasonable young woman such as Kate Berenger could be convinced that little green monsters existed, anyone could. He was about to pursue the topic further with her when he noticed the vanguard of their battalion standing near the front door. Although Dory did not realize it, his pub, with its very subdued indirect lighting, was a magnet for the gremlins, an ideal spot for them to relax after their early evening shenanigans. Darting out of the shadows bordering the main square, they gravitated naturally to this wondrous arena of free food, drink, games, and music. A person's jaw dropping, even several jaws dropping in concert, is not generally considered a measurable sound. Tonight, as Dory and his few customers, one by one, noticed the collection of forms moving slowly through the foyer toward them, their jaws dropping seemed to generate a negative force so powerful and complete 
not unlike a black hole in space, that it could be felt and heard as clearly as any explosion. The brief moment of paralysis and terrifying silence was immediately followed by a detonation of people, Dory included, toward the side and rear exits. Chairs fell, drinks were dropped or spilled, and bodies stumbled as the gremlins took over the bar as rapidly and thoroughly as if an opening night theater next door had just discharged its patrons. Chattering to each other in broken mogwai, hopping excitedly as they spotted the game machines and pool tables, the gremlins inundated Dory's pub in less than a minute. Dory was the last person to escape via the rear entrance. Looking back over his shoulder, he saw a confused and surrounded Kate hesitate and then retreat behind the bar as the sea of green cackling faces spread in unearthly agitated waves from one corner of his establishment to the other. A state of emergency at the Governor's Mall shopping plaza ever since the electronic doors jammed, trapping some 150 people inside the complex. The telephones are still working, however, although one by one the lines are being taken out of service by the same unseen forces that have been terrorizing Kingston Falls since shortly before 8 o'clock this evening. At last report, eyewitnesses stated that the chaos broke out in the mall when the escalators started moving at terrific speeds, perhaps as fast as 70 or 80 miles an hour. Passengers were spun off like tops and hurled through plate glass windows or into each other. This was followed by all the lights being turned off and the background music being turned up to a deafening volume. We'll keep you posted on this situation at Governor's Mall as we know many of you in our listening audience have loved ones or friends in that facility. We repeat that so far there have been no fatalities, although many have been injured. Elsewhere in the area, two more people have been attacked by Christmas trees. Swallowing the last morsel of her Dentimore beef stew, one large can of which lasted her three days, Mrs. Deagle sat back to await the start of her favorite nighttime soap opera on television, the one with so many despicable characters, whom she found singularly attractive. Once again, the doorbell's ringing disrupted her pleasure. Even more aggravating was the persistence of the callers, one of whom kept his finger against the button so that the chimes continued to sound endlessly. Fools! Mrs. Deagle hissed, struggling to her feet. I'll have them arrested! Flinging the door open, she nearly choked on the angry words she had prepared for the unwanted callers. She gasped, for how could one even begin to preach responsibility and common sense to a group outfitted such as this one? Were they a joke? Cooked up by the angry carolers? What is this? She finally managed to growl. A late Halloween prank? Well, I'll thank you to get off my porch and lawn this minute or I'm calling the police. The group, apparently oblivious to her attitude, began a sing-song mumbo-jumbo that was totally incomprehensible to Mrs. Deagle. <laughs> Get out of here, she shouted. I don't want to hear you, and I don't want to see you. Those costumes are terrible anyway. Very cheap and tacky and unconvincing. The giggly dirge continued. Leaving the front door open, Mrs. Deagle went inside and looked around for something to throw. As she did so, two of the creatures padded into the house and faded into the darkness. A moment later, Mrs. Deagle returned holding a broom. While inside, she had considered dousing them with a bucket of water, but her arms weren't strong enough to lift a full bucket, much less throw it. All right, she grated, moving toward the unwanted visitors. Now scram or else! When the gremlins continued singing, she lifted the broom and began thrashing left and right. More surprised than hurt, the creatures tumbled off the porch into the snow, quickly hopping to their feet to snarl defiantly at her. The exertion had caused Mrs. Deagle's heart to start pounding, 
and the night air was cold. An urge to return to the comparative warmth of her living room gripped her. But she took one final moment to glare them down before turning away. And don't come back, she snarled, going back inside. The chill had worked on her bladder, and she felt an urge to go upstairs to the bathroom. Miserable little creeps, she muttered, seating herself on the electric stairs climber and turning the switch to up. As she was in the process of doing this, one of the gremlins watched with increasing fascination. Meanwhile, in the kitchen, its partner took the opportunity to grab a late-night snack by stealing some of the cat's food. A huge tabby, not liking this, hissed and took a swipe at the gremlin's leg. He received a quick kick that sent him half sailing, half sliding across the kitchen floor. What's the commotion? Mrs. Deagle whined, putting the machine in neutral. She climbed down and started for the kitchen, grumbling as she stumbled along. Arriving at the swinging door of the room, she pushed it open to see a half dozen cats standing with tails upraised and fur as straight as a poker their wide eyes fixed on the door leading into the dining room. What is it? Mrs. Deagle demanded. I swear sometimes you stupid animals are more trouble than you're worth. It took her a while to clean up the spilled food, calm down the cats, and get some milk to help keep them calm, and make a perfunctory search of the dining room for them. She saw nothing. While she did these things, the gremlin at the stairway had a wonderful time with the old woman's elevator chair, twisting wires and changing leads almost as if it were a born electronics expert. Finally, the troubles apparently over, Mrs. Deagle sighed wearily and returned to her original problem, that of going to the bathroom. At last, she wheezed, a chance to relax. As she spoke, she disengaged the chair from neutral and pushed the switch back to up. Body was identified by his wife as that of Murray Futterman, a professional handyman and mechanic who was born in Kingston Falls and lived here all of his life, except for a brief stint in World War II. How Mr. Futterman was literally pushed through the wall of his garage by the snowplow is not known. The machine was still running when his body was discovered beneath it. Another unusual accident occurred not far away at the home of Mrs. Ruby Deagle, wife of the late real estate millionaire Donald Deagle. Mrs. Deagle, who used a stair-climbing device because of a bad heart, was found dead in that chair only minutes ago. The unusual thing was that the chair and Mrs. Deagle were not in her home, but in a vacant lot a tenth of a mile north of the Decatur Drive residence. The police officer who examined the circumstances of the case said that the chair apparently had gone completely haywire, carrying the woman up the stairs, through a window in the hallway, and on to the vacant lot. To have achieved such a trajectory and distance, the officer estimated that the chair must have been going at least 200 miles an hour. Yes, yes, uh-huh. This just in. A report that the green monsters have taken over an entire bar for the evening. Because of the demands placed on the Kingston Falls Police Department by the events of the past few hours, the owner of the bar known as Dory's Pub could not get in touch with the police. So he called this station to warn everyone to stay out of Dory's Pub. That's Dory's Pub, 460 West Main. The owner said that all the customers got out safely when the little people entered, except one waitress. Meanwhile, two more people fell into open manholes. Kate! Billy shouted, hitting the brake so quickly the car spun almost completely around in the road. He was nearly home, but now he would have to go all the way back to town. Darn it! He muttered. This is all my fault! Ah, uh, yes. My name's Damien Phillips, and I have a theory about all this. I... I have a brother who recently retired from the CIA, and he says the uh, Russians uh, developed a robot that... Shut up! Billy snapped, reaching forward to turn the car radio off. Accelerating as much as he dared to, on the icy streets, he peered through the small square of clearness generously given him by the VW's antiquated defrosting system. Like most citizens of Kingston Falls, he had been amused initially at some of the pranks committed by the gremlins, partially because he had experienced a secret longing to see what might happen if every traffic light showed green. 
But that and pulling a man into a mailbox and rolling tires down a hill were far cries from the most recent mishaps engineered by the gremlins. Mr. Futterman is dead, Billy whispered. The poor guy. I can't believe it. He did believe it, though, and the corollary was painfully self-evident. If these creatures could kill Mr. Futterman and Mrs. Deagle, and perhaps others, they could also kill Kate without a second thought. His engine roaring as the wheels spun beneath him, Billy breathed a silent prayer that he would make it in time. Okay, Slashaholics, you've just heard an early access upload from the Patreon page. On Patreon, you'll get early access to this book and others to be named in the future. All early access titles on Patreon will have weekly chapter uploads that premiere on Patreon before they premiere on YouTube. So, if you want to have early access to Gremlins and other great novelizations and tie-in books before the uploads reach YouTube, head on over to Patreon. Thank you all so much for listening. Hope you're enjoying this book so far. And as always, pleasant dreams! Be sure to subscribe, click that like button, and click that bell. Also, check out the companion channel, the 80 Slasher Library After Hours, for all the great podcast and original content. Links are in the description below. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit. You can find those links in the description below as well as well as our merch store and the Patreon page. You can support the channel for as low as $2 per month, get some great stuff like free ebooks, free merch, voice a character, and an audiobook narration, and so much more. Tonight's upload is brought to you by our patrons on the Patreon page. When Master Evil comes to play and Mother says that it's okay Alex and Josh are